Well, first off, thanks everybody for making time. I know there's a lot of uh, opportunities for you to attend panels, um, but you made a wise choice and you chose the best. So thanks for being here. Um, nothing more exciting um, than getting a chance to talk to the luminaries on stage today and celebrating the 40th anniversary of, of Def Jam. And so I wanted to kind of talk about both um, the past um, and the present uh, and per the title of the panel, what's next, what we can expect. Def Jam is a brand and a business of firsts. Um, leaders in music, leaders in culture, leaders in a lot of different parts of our lives. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to turn it over to the panel. So I'm going to start with Chuck. Um, and wanted to maybe take us back a little bit to the beginning um, because you shaped a lot of what Def Jam is today and been there through those, those eras. So maybe you can kind of give us some, some of the highlights for you and being part of, of what it is and, and everything that got created from the work that you and your fellow musicians produced. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, for, what's up, uh, South by Southwest? So, you know, they gave us an order to sit in and, and immediately I had Lady London sit right here because being flanked by the present and the future energy of Def Jam I'm so honored, so that's why we switched up at the last minute. Because number one, Def Jam started as a, spontane uh, a spontaneous explosion. Really, it started out with T. La Rock and Jazzy J and, and Rick Rubin doing a record with another distributor before they realized, like, well, this ain't going to actually, you know, be a check in our account. So Rick Rubin and Russell Simmons started the Purple Label in 1984. My, myself, along with my cohorts, Bill Stephanie, Hank Shockley, we covered it, because we were DJs, so we covered the explosion in the debut of Def Jam as writers, as promoters, as also outside DJs and musicians, just like many of y'all out there. So we covered it from the outside in, and we tried to make a competitor to Def Jam, because they were closer to New York City than us. But Long story short, Rick Rubin tried to recruit me for two years, and finally, after two years, we decided not to be a competitor and then join Def Jam. So you had the initial artists of the Beastie Boys, um, LL Cool J, an original concept. And when we came in 1986, 87, we kind of put electricity to the building that already was being built. And that's 40 years ago, and then 35 years ago, it was a connection of the record company being enjoined with the management company because management from the outside was looking at rap music and hip hop as this temporary thing. And when we joined in, we said, listen, we can make this thing as hard as the rock guys out there, the rock world. Uh, last, lastly, before we move it on, Run DMC was meant, and Jam Master J, they were meant to be on Def Jam. And one of the biggest you know, biggest hurts of, of all time is that they never ever got a chance to record on Def Jam and bear the fruits, although they planted the seeds. So this coming full circle 40 years later and the energy of these two great people, uh, to me, just to come in as, as a, a person that, that can give stories but give advice, past, present, and future, it's a joy. So we don't have to go back as far. We could bring up the pack. It's like talking about the Yankees or the Lakers or some of y'all, although I'm a Knicks fan. But um, <laughs> yeah, talking about Def Jam, the present and the future, especially with all the tools and technologies and the energy and the, and the fact that I think women are the future of rap music and hip hop under their own terms. And, and, I, and listen, and I say this on a day that a day after that, one of the foundational artists on Def Jam in the 90s, Boss, who also was a Texas resident, had passed away yesterday. So we go full circle, but we go forward. Thank you. Speaking of growing up in, in Brooklyn, how did, how did Def Jam shape you and your music and, and your artistry, Lady London? Um, hey, y'all. It's my first time here, so I'm super happy to be amongst you all. Um, I grew up between the Bronx and Jersey, and so even bigger than Brooklyn, no shade. 
is um <laughs> is the fact that we birthed hip hop. You know, uh, it was born in the Bronx in the '70s, and so um, I think growing up in hip hop culture, although I am younger, I was born in the mid '90s, and when I think about hip hop, I'm like, wow, look how far we came from being such a small genre of music to becoming the highest streamed genre of music right now is crazy to me. Um, you go from seeing Rick Rubin and, and Russell Simmons cultivate such a dope environment. Um, you watch you watch time evolve, right? You see the Rockefeller, you see the Murder, Inc., you see us incorporate, because, you know, again, no shade, New Yorkers, we didn't accept everybody when we came into hip hop. We, we, we let the South come in and watch what they were able to do. We saw the Ludacris, we saw the Young Jeezys of the world. We introduced the Midwest and breaking Kanye West and so many other things. Um, so just watching Def Jam, it's a pillar of our community as we know hip hop to be. There will be no strong foundation for hip hop without Def Jam Records. And it's just what it is. So I'm happy to be celebrating 40 years here as the future face of hip hop. Yeah. And Tunji, you've got the privilege of stewarding the Def Jam brand, you know, into the future. Uh, what what does that mean for you and in, in your role? Man, um, first of all, it's an honor to be here with two incredible lyricists and also with my friend Brian, who I've known since literally the beginning of my career. He was one of my first bosses ever. Um, I mean, it's like it's like they both said, it's much more than a label. It's there's a whole culture behind Def Jam. Um, there's a whole world that feels bigger than just music and artists and you know, I remember when I was growing up, because I'm 40 years old as well, so I'm the same age as the label. I'm the first person that's running the label that like really grew up on the label, you know? So my perspective is a lot different than my predecessors, but it was the first record label when I was a kid where we actually like, you know, we knew who the executives were. You know, we, we it, it felt like much more than just great records. It felt like a whole environment and a community and you know, um, I'm just trying to foster that in the future with with another new generation of great artists. I also feel like Def Jam has always represented cutting edge black music. And obviously in, in 1984, that would be New York hip hop. And I think you've seen the label evolve over time, just like Lady was explaining to expand into different regions and, uh, and different genres. Um, but you know, don't forget that Beastie Boys were there at the beginning. And you know that's that leads 20 years later, 30 years later, to an artist like a Justin Bieber being signed to Def Jam, um, who you know at the end of the day is making black music. And I feel like as long as we continue to represent that, you know, it, it, the label will move forward into the future and continue, you know, to have that next 40 years. And for me, cutting edge black music in this era, obviously, hip hop will always be at the center of that. But it also includes other genres like R&B and dance music and pop music and Afro beats and dance hall and, you know, I really want to want to cultivate an environment that is a safe space for artists from all those different corners of the world and all those different genres uh, to coexist, work on stuff together and really just push each other to, you know, another great run, another great addition to the legacy. So I'm just doing my part. I'm also a rapper, so like, you know, that's how this whole thing started for me. I was supposed to be a rapper, somehow I ended up becoming an A&R guy. Um, but I think the reason why I w became a very good A&R guy was because I was an artist first. So my relationships in the creative community were genuine and my motivation was, was very much from a creative, genuine space. And it, it all just kind of built from there. I could tell the whole story, but that's a whole nother panel. Next time. So, so Chuck, the world's changed a bit in the last 40 years and how you connected with your fans then and how you connect with fans now. So, so how do you stay connected with the, the fans from the beginning and, and how do you connect with the new fans of, of today and introduce them to, to your work and Public Enemy and all of the different music that you're producing? Well, hell, you said the world's changed in 40 years. The world's changed in the last four years. Yeah. Uh, you, you stay connected like in ball, in sports, they say that the team is only as good as the coaching and the players. Um, 
I think in the Def Jam situation, Toonsy coming along, he, you know, he's almost like he's like a championship young coach who also knows what it is to relate to the players that played. I think when it's something comes in like a public enemy, you stay connected because you recognize all the tools. I, I was on the forefront of um, the 1999-1998-2000 go to Congress and fight for, fail, for file sharing type wars. And um, it was a, a evening out of the, the majors and the independents. So what I had to do, I knew I couldn't fully at that particular time rely on a major record company to get me to my fans who are in every single continent, even the North and the South Pole. So I said, why am I contracted with this situation if you're not recognizing the pioneering innovations that's, that's evening out the playing field? So I left the fold in 1998, and I, I ventured strongly and rather successfully in the area of technology, you know, being able to, you know, elbow with what Steve Jobs was doing when the whole industry gave the industry gave it away to iTunes and thought they were getting over because they only thought Apple was 5% of the computer market. So they give them everything. And Steve Jobs comes up with iTunes and turns the industry upside down. But also being aware of all these moves and coming here like five or six times talking about how artists should think about recognizing these technologies and empowering themselves. Uh, the, the biggest thing that artists want to know right away is like, if I'm not going to deal with a big record company, how am I, how am I going to make a living? And I, I would very clearly say, well, you're dealing with the arts. And myself with an art background, just dealing in graphic arts and, and all kinds of visual arts, you always have to get in the conversation of the one, meaning one fan at a time, or one piece at a time. So as an independent, we had to look at one person at a time. And at the end of a, a, a great work effort, then you have a culmination of a tribe or a whole lot of people that will stay connected with you. But this was like, what, 20, 25 years ago. Artists since then knew that they would be connected with people that had their like interests. And so the majors now have to have a person like Tunji to be you know, aware of what's out there and what could be built and in what they have in the catalog area like myself and be aware of a lady London who also seriously, you know, is an artist where in an age where people listen with their eyes. So you listen with their eyes. So instead of saying this is a sonic delivery, it's sight, sound, story, and style. That's what music is today. And artists have to hit on all four points, especially to stay in tune with the conversation between them and their fanatics. So we're at this venture point in 2024, in the 40th year, where it truly is just, it's just the beginning because new tools are coming in and a new way of looking at the connection between artists, fan base, and then those that are able to spread, spread it around the earth and beyond. And I say beyond because right now they have satellite wars. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, it's very important to have energy, young energy to be able to figure this out because you want that connection. You don't want the fan base to feel that they're better than you. You want them to be continuously awestruck. And that's how you spell audience in this 2020 period. Audience, A-W-E-D-N-S. Once you have them awestruck, then anything can happen after that. But you gotta continue to have that cut above to make them go, wow, damn, I can't do that shit, damn, they dope. And that is the core of fanaticism. I mean, we could say what we want to say about ball, but the closer we get to the court or the field or the diamond, we as fans say, yeah, all right, yeah we can't do that shit. <laughs> I thought I, I thought Scottie Pippen was short, but nah, damn, dog. <laughs> so we want them to say the same thing about the artists because, you know, people sing in the shower and they do their thing on the other side of the TV, on the radio, but when the closer you get to an artist that's really doing their thing, you, you, like, okay, I'll just be a fan for a while, you know? And that's good. That's good for this label and good for the future of music. Speaking of awestruck, so as a lyricist, you are leading the next generation uh, at Def Jam and, and broadly in the industry. So who inspired you early on? And 
How are you defining your own space and, and where you go with your music? Wow, um, loaded question, Ryan. Um, I'm inspired by so many and by so much. Um, I'm inspired by, of course, those who came before me. I'm inspired by environmental stimuli. I'm inspired by my own upbringing. I'm inspired by um, different cultures. I'm inspired by my college experiences. So if I begin with musicians, in a, in, a, in a bit of an unorthodox way, I'm inspired by people who aren't even rappers, just by people's approach to music. I like savants. Like when I think of like true musicians, a Quincy Jones, a Prince, you know, people that like multi-instrumentalists, mega producers, mega engineers, which is why in my craft, I'm always like, how can I learn how to play the piano? Or let me hear the, like, I can hear instruments individually in my music. Um, so I say that to say in rap music, I love Slick Rick. He's one of my favorites um, because I approach all of my lyricism in a narrative way. It's always a story that's being told. It's always um, vivid imagery that I seek to paint the picture of. And um, so him, Kane, uh, Jay-Z, obviously, Jadakiss, um, Foxy, MC Light, um, Kim, I mean, Lauren, Lauren is, is Whitney Houston, Janet Jackson, literally so many women that I just like their poise as well. Like if you, I love Janet, like I love Janet. I met Janet, y'all, I met Janet two years ago. <laughs> I met Janet two years ago and I secretly lost my mind internally. But um, it's just so many that I'm inspired by, so much that I'm inspired by. And I hope to not only do so much for rap music, as it is right now, because we're in a very interesting state. Very interesting is the word that I'll use. Um, but I hope to transcend a generation with my style of approach to music. So, yeah. Nice. Tanji. <laughs> you shared early on that as an artist that, that enabled you to connect in the industry in a unique way. And one of your gifts and, and talents in your career is being able to connect with talent and find talent. And so in that process you know, of evolving and connecting and enabling a lot of amazing careers along the way, kind of what, what, what were those connections that, that supported that? How did, how did you become the a and steward that you are prior to Def Jam, and, and how are you bringing those gifts with you in going forward? Yeah, um, I mean, I would say before I was an artist, I was a fan, you know? Um, and the most important connection in music is between the artist and the fan. Um, and as my career and my life have evolved, I've remained a fan. And my favorite thing to do, I'm a nerdy fan too, like, I go deep. You know, I, I wanna hear everything first, I'm searching everywhere. And I also at this point just have like a worldwide network of people who are sending me dope shit. And um, also Lady London, Lady London mentioned producers. Having great relationships in the producer community has helped my career tremendously because they're the ones who are making the records before they even become records. So, um, you know, I, I was able to kind of gain trust, I would say, because I came from an artist space. But my approach has always been to really dig deep into the underground because the the pop star of the future is the underground superstar of, of today you know so and, and i've seen it happen so many times i've seen i've seen someone who was all the way left of center and you know very very different from what was happening in the mainstream remain themselves work really hard build their story and turn into the next star um and I, you know, the one that really inspired me at the beginning of my career was um, I was lucky to be at Warner Brothers Records when J-Rock from TDE got signed. So I was able to meet Kendrick Lamar when he was K-Dot very early. And um, he was extremely talented, but he hadn't really put all, his, all the pieces of his artistry together yet. He was the hype man for J-Rock, which is how, why he was in the building. I was a marketing assistant. So they would come in and have a J-Rock meeting 
and I couldn't go to the meeting because I was an assistant, and he couldn't go to the meeting because he was the hype man. So we became friends, and we would just like talk about hip hop and debate, you know, who's nicer, Lil Wayne or Lupe or whatever. And um, you know, this is at, at the time I was still really active in making music and running around LA and doing shows and stuff like that. And then you know, years later, two or three years later, I ended up at Interscope, and he had changed his name from K Dot to Kendrick Lamar, which is you know his government first and middle name, and he had just. He'd simply just become the best rapper in the world. <laughs> like, he, whatever the hell he was doing for those three, four years, I, I know he went on a lot of tours and just really honed his craft on stage in the studio. And, you know, I, I saw this kid perform for 20 people, you know, in, in, on the rocks. And, like, there's a flyer, you know, from 2009, I think, where we did a show together, you know. So I was really there at the very beginning, and then I was able to see and help him get into the Interscope building. I didn't sign him because I couldn't sign people because, again, I was an assistant. But I was, <laughs> but I was the one who was running around telling all the A&Rs, you know, this kid, is the, this kid is the future, you gotta. We gotta get this kid. And, you know, eventually he got signed to Interscope. Dre got involved. You know, Good Kid, Mad City came out, classic album. And me getting that little A&R coordinator credit on that album is what sparked my career as an A&R in a real way. But the real lesson of that story was seeing a true artist who fought through the adversities of being a different type of artist and was able to make it all the way into the mainstream without sacrificing or compromising who he really is. In fact, I would say his music became more complex and more weird <laughs> as, as, as he got bigger. And you know, that's my, favorite, that's my favorite thing to see, is like someone who comes from the left, um, an underdog who's able to beat the odds and not change the, the essence of what they are. That's what Lady London is to me, you know? That's what Public Enemy was able to do. So that kind of became my mission statement. It was like, if he could do it, I, I want to work with artists that can, that can do that. So um, yeah, and, and also just taking chances. Uh, it's funny because I started in hip hop, but most people know me because, I'm, because of like my R&B signings, because I signed a lot of new generation R&B acts like Bryson Tiller, Khalid, SZA, um, her, I didn't sign her, but I a and would her, uh, Lucky Day, you know, I signed Kate Trinata, I signed Childish Gambino. Um, I was also the first person in America signing Afrobeats, which for me was a big cultural tie. Yeah, because my parents are from Nigeria, and I grew up in Nigeria a little bit, so. You know, being able to eventually sign a WizKid or a David O or a Thames, all these things for me just go back to like what I said at the beginning, like being a fan and just, you know, I'm like a fan that snuck into the back of the show and like started programming everything. So, um, yeah, just staying true to, to where I started and again, like supporting people who have something different to bring to the table because if you can, if you can really build that the right way, you know, it could be transformative. Hip hop happened because it's everywhere today, right? And, but there were some folks like yourself, Chuck, who paved the way for it to happen. Um, and there were a lot of roadblocks along the way. And you enabled all of these careers to kind of flourish and, and take off. Well, that's, what, that's what makes it fun. The roadblocks in the way, so you could just kick down the doors and and beat it down and go forward. You know, it's no no guarantees. That's the thing about it. That's what makes uh, the energy of art and culture and music so great. So I don't know if I was cutting off your question, Brian, but in this time, the, the the beautiful aspect, and I'm a big Motown fan, which is also at Universal Group. For years, I was waiting for somebody to be able after Gerald Busby, and he passed away. But I was like. Wow, it would be so great if somebody has the energy of Barry Gordy to really, you know, go into the Four Tops tapes or go into uh, have the Four Tops new make new music or something like that in their whatever uh, configuration they might have or combination, you know, and that never really happened. So often the acquisition becomes a shell. That's not really happening with Def Jam because of Tunji because he's bringing these, these energies and this vision, which might be uncomfortable to many at, at, at 
at, at many uh, different vantage points, but at the same time, it all leads to the right innovation of being able to have artistry. And it's easy to call something dope and whack. I mean, that's, that's, it's easy to say that. But as we're entering a time of artificial intelligence and its momentum and its speed, artificial intelligence is not going backward and is never going whack. Its goal is to make something perfect in sight, sound, story, and style. So being able to find an artistry that has the perfect imperfections, you want to keep the scars sometime. You want to keep the, 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 the gristle in the dirt. That's the beautiful thing about artistry that it is formed out of this idea and this step forward that comes in the, into the unknown and uncertainty and then with the confidence of a label or management or a situation, say, yeah, keep stepping, fuck it, you know? That's what makes it in the first place. Something that you ne necessarily don't have to see or hear, but you got to feel it. It's got to be something in the feeling. And even if it's wrong, if you can feel it and it goes forward, then that's what makes it dope, all right? We've lost that in the ability to thinking that we will always get the most perfect something at the end of the day. And now with artificial intelligence, you're never gonna get more perfect than that. So where's the, swir where's the swerve, where's the bend? Where, where's, where's the, 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 the whip with the wop, you know what I'm saying? That's what music offers, and this is what initially, kind of like last century, is not the same as far as people dance to it. They dance to a rhythm that came like that. Now Afrobeat will give you a rhythm. Now what will you do with Afrobeat? You gonna listen to it, nod to it, or you gonna dance to it, or stare at it? So this is the job and also the joy of an artist doing their thing and feeling confident about it. They got to keep on going forward, but they also got to have the confidence behind them to do their thing. There were a lot of walls that you knocked down along the way. Were there some you climbed over, you blew them up, whatever it was to kind of get to where you were going? Were there some kind of key moments in time that you felt catalyzed? I to talk at. about, but I, I think at the turn of the century, it, it's already classified. I mean, that whole thing of file sharing, the majors had a chance to embrace file sharing, and they didn't. They could have made it in 1998, they could have turned the MP3 into a great way to deliver singles. So up to that point, they were delivering albums with 18 tracks that nobody could hear and promoting one song and one video, which would cost 80 times more than the whole album being made. They made crucial mistakes that led them into file sharing, which has been going on you know, unofficially and officially for the last 20, now 24 years. So here we are right now in this space. I, feel, I felt proud that I knocked down the door so somebody could be at home making something at their crib that might end up going to the marketplace and being picked up by one of the major. Um, what I didn't foresee, I didn't, I didn't come out to destroy the majors. I didn't think that when, in 1998, when I got involved, that we would go from six down to three. That's a little troubling to me, because if you got Sony, Warner, and Universal, that means in the music as it goes forward, and so many artists out there, what we have, what we need, is think is an administrative body, what hip hop needs and what the Def Jams need is like a whole bunch of people that are able to evaluate the talent. In sports, you got the players, but there's way more people outside of the game that contribute to making the game strong. We don't got that in music. Once upon a time, like we had the source, okay, one magazine, then rap sheet, two magazines. So you got four magazines that's covering everybody. Now we got like, blogs and you know and we have to step up to the point where somebody out there being a fan could be rewarded for evaluating the talent out there because that is your true core middle fan base sports they got podcasts they sell the game and music we need a lot of people that's outside of the artistry who are favored to sell the game that 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 also tell the story of a tunji and tell the story of Lady London and being able to tell a story of like how the Beastie Boys contributed and all this without it getting caught up in mythology and hype and hearsay and talks that ain't really based on nothing. You know, I mean, I tell people all the time, hip hop does not move if not for the Caribbean. So you cannot 
detach the Caribbean from hip hop. So anybody that comes up and, and encounters that, I say, you fucking crazy. That's when I go in my New York mode. And I know how to curse very fucking well. <laughs> so sometimes, we, as OGs, we could be nice and in the cut. But when you hear stuff out there, you got to cut it off. And those are the obstacles that you want to slice off when people come up with mythology to serve their own interests. There's an actual fact here. Def Jam is documented. It's a movie called Crush Groove, people. You can see the actual beginnings of Def Jam. It's not called Def Jam, but it's right there. You're looking at Rick Rubin. You're looking at LL Cool J getting his debut. You're looking at Russell Simmons in there, although he didn't play the Russell Simmons part, but he's in it too. It's documentation. And whenever you could throw documentation away like it don't mean shit, that's when you have a problem with whatever you're trying to get across to a population. Fake news, fake news. <laughs> Def Jam is particularly compelling because you, it transcends music. You know, Russell and the rest of the team did Def Jam comedy, they did Def Jam poetry, they did video games with EA, Def Jam Vendetta. And I watch you and everything that you're doing. You know, you're, you seem to be a film producer and you're, Take, you're a photographer and, and you're a musician and you're into fashion and you're into all of these different things and so you're, and you're a business person at the same time. So how does that all kind of come together for creating who you are and your music and your connection with your fans and your business? Yeah, I think um, when I came into the game transparently, I just wanted, wanted to rap people to death. <laughs> like... I didn't care about nothing else. I just wanted to prove that I was one of the greatest, definitely one of the greatest female lyricists of the 21st century, period, stamped. Yeah, that's just, that's what I wanted to do when I was first coming in. And then as I began to cultivate not only my career, but the foresight I have for myself in the next 10 to 20 years, I was like, I would love to be a brand. Beyond my own artistry, brands are forever. Brands are, when you are a brand, your reputation stays in rooms for longer than you do. And you are in rooms that you haven't even entered yet. Your name, your brand is in those rooms already. And so I, I began to think to myself, what is it that I want to represent? What is it that I want the Lady London brand to personify outside of I'm the best lyricist? Like, I rap people to death, right? Okay. I'm like, I would love it to focus on the black family education, economic empowerment, the arts, health, travel, beauty, and fashion. Those are my core initiatives because that's what I cared about. That's what I've always cared about. In my studies, I, I have both my degrees are in medical sciences from Howard University, HU to real, uh-huh. And, and from University of Southern California. And so when I think about my trajectory in rap music, I wanna be a well-rounded artist if, if I leave this earth with nothing more than my name and my brand, understand it to be clean. You know, sometimes your power is not in your position, but in your posture and in your poise. And so the way that I walk in rooms and the way that I dominate rooms with just the way that I am, who the woman that I've made myself to be is so important for me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, juggling business and juggling rap music and juggling you know, my passions, it's a full-time job, but it's something that it has to coexist. It has to, I'm not, I'm not one dimensional. I'm not just a rapper. I'm not just, uh, you know, a, a sister or, or a medical person. I'm, I'm all of these things that make up Lady London and it's very important that I continue to walk in that, you know? You only got one person to be, everybody else is already taken. <laughs> We're gonna to try to save some time for questions, um, but I did want to kind of go through and, you know, ask you all a question about if we came back here in 40 years, what would we be talking about? 40. 40. So if this is the first 40, what's the next 40 look like? Oh, in 40 or four? 40. 40. I'm gonna be dead, dude. <laughs> <laughs> 40 years. I'll be no, 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 three, dog. <laughs> 
No, nah, no, nah, every day is important, man. So if you said four, I'd be like, damn, I didn't know we was going to break up into five countries. But um, <laughs> that's real talk. I, listen, I was telling Brian yesterday, you're doing a great job, by the way, Brian. When I first started touring on a Def Jam tour, us and LL Cool J, we played Germany and we had to play, you know, West Germany. So to go in and play East Germany, you're on one road on a bus and you got to get waking up with dogs and flashlights, because there's one road to play Berlin, which is split into East Berlin and West Berlin. And all your fans on the, on the East Berlin side listening to the radio commercials to come to the Public Enemy LL Cool J Def Jam concert, they can't come, because you got a barricade Cade in there with people on stanchions with guns ready to fire and shoot them at the wall as they want to get close to the concert. So that was what? you know, what, how we, 40 years ago, I mean, well, 35, 36 years ago. So we've come a long way. And, I, you know, like I said, and, and, and I saw the, the wall fall two years later. The public enemy was playing a concert and the wall came down and all of a sudden the East was open. So it's crazy uh, to predict 40 years ahead, but you do want to take three to five years at a time. I think my life personally is always made up of three to five year increments because you find out that you write half a life and the other side writes itself. And same thing with creation and creativity where you find out like, I didn't know that I would end up doing that or being that or that would end up being there. So I think the energy is very, very important. The confidence of the energy. I think the beautiful thing about music and, and culture that it brings the human being together for our similarities and knocks the differences to the side. But governments think in opposition to that. So to continue to make feel good, human connecting, sometimes rebelling music is always life-saving and life-serving. I hope in 40 years, 40 years I'll be in my late 60s, I just hope to still look good. And I hope that I'm, I got at least 10 hit records that I could tour if I wanted to and get up on that stage like like a Tina Turner or something, you know, just still looking good. <laughs> uh, in 40 years, I will be 80 years old. Um, hopefully still making great records, working with great artists, staying inspired. Um, Chuck made a point earlier about how labels were not embracing technology 25-ish years ago. Ironically, I was one of those kids that was downloading everything. And it, that's, that was a huge part of my music education and you know, learning about artists that either I didn't grow up during the era of or didn't have the money to buy the music of. So you know, I would download the whole Beatles discography and you know, listen to everything, and, or I download all of Stevie and spend a month diving into Stevie. Um, but I mean, I, I think in this era, technology is, is bringing creatives closer together, and I think it's breaking down walls. And hopefully in the future, we'll have a, a more connected global conversation of creatives and music and artists. And I think you can, you can see and hear how different genres are influencing one another. I mean, hip hop is, is in every genre now, actually. It's funny when people are like, hip hop's falling. But then you, you look at the other genres that they're saying are growing, and I'm like, you're like these people, these are rappers. Like, <laughs> this is just a different language or a different style, but it's all kind of based on, on rap and hip hop. But, you know, I hope in, in 40 years we see a more open, global, creative conversation and, and that people are, you know, using and, and drawing from influences that are beyond just their doorstep. Because now you can actually like connect with someone who's 20,000 miles away from you. And you can hear and be exposed to sounds and styles that when I was a kid, you know, there was no way for me to hear what was going on in South Africa. But now it's like, you know, American kids are dancing to On My Piano Records. And, you know, the, the UK rap scene is now getting almost as big as the, you know, a UK rapper can actually like compete on a global level or, you know, things like that. I think, I think we'll see more of those uh, walls coming down, ironically, to uh, reference something that Chuck mentioned earlier as well. I, I'd like to add to one thing. 
Uh, my, myself and my manager, Laurie Buller, we talk about this. What We want to end also the stigma of genreism. I mean, when we got in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, 36th group, I think 10 years ago, the biggest talk was like, well, that's not rock and roll. I said, well, who the fuck you think is the role, baby? <laughs> Let's shut up all the rockheads, right? <laughs> Without even going into the discussion of the blues and rock and its history, I ain't, I ain't gonna waste you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna freeze you on that one when they try to figure out what the role is. But the ending of genreism, where there's so much before the year 2000 that could be protected, in this catalog without the excuses. Well, nobody cleared it. I mean, with three majors controlling pretty everything, I'm pretty sure a resolution could be made somewhere where the, the, the classic period before 2000 in the area of catalog, box sets, legacy, um, connection, branding, can actually be at least revered like Sticks and Foreigner and not even Led Zeppelin, but Def Leppard. I mean, that. You go into the vaults and those majors, uh, major company, and they, their managements and their fan base and their surroundings protect those groups and those masters like that shit is uranium. You can't go in and touch a Miles Davis master. You can't go in. So these companies preserve the master, but the legalities that seem like it's insurmountable that they got to handle to take care of hip hop catalog was one of the reasons that I stepped into the Def Jam, I said, there's a world bef before 2000 that need to be preserved. Uh, hey, look, you won't even be able to go into a Rolling Stone, we talk about the Rolling Stone, the Who, the Beatles, and, and, you know, and, and Led Zeppelin. Those masters at the same companies are like vaulted. So Def Jam is a beautiful place to start to say, we, our vaults are pristine, but they have to go in, there's a lot of dynamics that have to go in it. Legalities have to be flipped and changed, and there has to be a concerned body of interest from fan and working population alike that are able to make these changes so when the legacy artists for the next 40 years come along, they know that it's not in vain and not in chaos and despair. So that's very important, and that's one of my reasons why when I first had the conversations with the new Def Jam, and conversations with Toonzy and seeing what the, the work that Lady London is doing now and the energy, and also what you're bringing to the table, Brian, just in the conversation of opening up. This is what people need to see other than, oh yeah, that's that hip hop shit, and I'm glad that hip hop 50 shit is over with, and by the way, you know, like it's the biggest music in the world, but I don't know fucking why. We're gonna give you reasons why. So what's next for you? So what, what, what can we expect from Lady London? What can't you expect? The world is mine. <laughs> the world is mine, you know, and you have to speak like that, honestly. I, I believe I'm the biggest in any room, so I, I walk in that stride. So I think for me, um, short term, what's next is a tour um, and new music and uh, just like getting, getting my point across and maintaining Maintaining myself and my integrity through it all, you know. Tunji, what's what's next for you and Def Jam? Um, just more, just really trying to represent and be that destination for uh, black music from all around the world. I'm just gonna keep running, running in that direction. Um, I also just became a dad, so teaching my daughter about music. Excited about that. Yeah, I'm excited to, to, to play her records and, and you know, see where her, her ear is at. And Chuck, what's next for you? Uh, I, I, I created, a, I'm a technologist, so we created the world's first cultural media app called Bring the Noise. Y'all could go in the store. Yes, it's TikTok 35 and up, but it's a lot better than that. It won't get kicked out of the United States. Not to say that's always a bad thing either, but if you go to bringthenoiseapp.com, it's the world's first cultural media app. It's, 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 it's dynamic, we have thousands of users, and it's just an alternative for the fans. It's filmmakers, artists, musicians, 
in sports. And then we tell people, you know, if you got drama and chaos, leave that shit over there. There's X, there's IG, there's Facebook, there's YouTube. Keep it over there. It's, we kind of got a nice artistic community of uploads and, and, um, and it's growing. So that's what's now for me. All right. Well, what's, what's now before we take questions is a, a little sneak peek of a video from Def Jam for its 40th anniversary. There's no sound, so just pretend you can hear the music. But you can hear the sound if you go to Def Jam's website. DefJam.com, let's go. Chuck, you could beatbox if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the logo's like the, like the Yankees logo. There's a lot of people that wear the Yankees logo and don't even know what it means or why they're wearing it. But, uh, when, you know, Def Jam is a thing where people wore it and people knew exactly what it meant. It was hip hop. Um, so that's, I wore the P hat because of Roberto Clemente, but it also could stand for public. So, yeah, so symbols are, are an important thing and the Def Jam logo and symbol, um, Holds his own. Rick Rubin designed that with the arm. He comes from a um, from a, a from an art background as well, and it's held up. That's that's the thing about something visually. If it holds up, that means it's solid. You know. Kudos all right, we're gonna Rick. go to some questions. We got the. All right. So first question for everyone: Who's an artist not on Def Jam that you've got your eye on? This is a round robin. Anybody who wants to answer can ask. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite new artists is uh, this kid, YG Marley, who has a song, only one song out. It's called Praise John in the Moonlight. He is Lauren Hill's son, Bob Marley's grandson. Um, he, his record is one of my favorites right now. All right. What are your thoughts on the emergence of UK artists and subgenres, e.g. grime and drill. Do you see a future where Def Jam works with these types of artists? Um, we already are. Uh, there is a, a Def Jam in the UK, 0207 Def Jam. Stormzy is one of their artists um, who's really, really dope. But yeah, I mean, of course, uh, I think Hip hop has, has gone global, so at this point, there there's a, a rap scene in every country. You know, we we signed a really exciting rapper from Nigeria named Odumodu Black, who is up and coming, but like the biggest hip hop artist I would say that's come out of the continent. And you know, to me, there's there's no the borders are gone. It's just yeah. is it is it special? Is it really like cutting edge? Is it, is it something that can that can cut through? I'm going to put in a shame, shameless plug here. If you go to that app that I told you, Bring the Noise, I happen to put a feature of our rap station, which has been running for 15 years or 11 station channels, and we have Planet Earth, Planet Rap, which is curated hip-hop from 116 countries for the last 15 years. So you can hear that 24 hours a day. It's curated, the way the artists come from. It's solid. So if you go to bringthenoiseapp.com, like I'm telling you again, <laughs> It will behoove you not just to be uh, 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 on the audience side of it, but also a participant. So also that has to do with the field that's out there, like what you've done with Bandcamp, the field of whoever's future for any situation that's bigger got to come from a situation, a minor league system that they grow to the top and they're undeniably ready for the position. So that's the beautiful thing about now. This was 30 years ago. A lot of people, is hard. you got to go to L.A. or New York or maybe Toronto or London to be able to get a chance to get a shot or when somebody comes on tour to, to audition for them so they could take you to L.A. or New York. It's no longer like that. The center of the earth is wherever you want to make the center of your recording or your artistry. Nice. What's the, the most important thing a female Latina in the hip hop industry needs to know before breaking through in the hip hop industry? Um, 
I would say I'm, I'm guessing they mentioned Latina because they probably have some um, like Spanish in their music. Um, okay, period. Okay, Jennifer, period. Um, I would say the most important thing is understanding timing um, because you have such. Uh, I think I think I would say, and maybe you guys would agree. I think you have an upper hand in a way being able to cross over into markets that not all artists could do. The, the Latin market and I think just making those crossover records and knowing the timing in which it's time for you to cross over from hip hop to you know having a hip hop and Latin record is, is very important and critical to not do it like too early or you know sometimes like that. Um, but I would say just stay true to yourself and I just I'm speaking as a woman in hip hop. So maybe you guys have. Some. All right, this is from, I guess I got to call it his name, Matt Fry. Uh, Chuck, do you recall touring with the Fat Boys on the Wipeout Tour in 1987 in San Antonio where you changed my life? Answer is nope. Um, we didn't play, well, maybe the Fat Boys was on that show, but I do remember is that McGill Coliseum, I remember almost every show out of like thousands of shows. McGill Coliseum, the place looked like a big, a, you know those campers that got made out of silver? That's what the whole arena looked like that, with cows in the back. With, in the back. But I do remember a young Shaquille O'Neal in high school coming there, dressed like a b-boy with a thick gold rope. He called me Uncle Chuck, and he says, yo, man, you brought me on stage. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. Okay, I remember that from that gig, but I don't remember the Fat Boys being on it. <laughs> All right, for Tunji, you talked about artists staying true to themselves as they continue to grow their art and career. Can you speak on how you stayed true as a, and grew it in Def Jam? Um, I mean, I don't really understand the question. <laughs> but uh, I will say that I am unapologetically myself through all the work that I do. And it really, at, at a certain point, it stopped. Like the border between my personal life, my life, and my job kind of just went away. And it's all just one thing. It's just, it's just who I am. And I, and I, feel like I figured out a way to make a career doing what I love the most, um, which is being around artists and, and putting out records. So uh, I would say that's the way that I, could, that I stay true to myself. And honestly, just trusting my ear and my gut and you know, really working hard to stay ahead of the curve and take chances on artists that you know, are unafraid to take risks and try new sounds and new approaches, uh, yeah. All right. This is from Christina. Chuck, I love your music and your art. Is there anything that you're able to accomplish or convey with your visual art that you cannot through music? Oh, wow. Thank you. I put out five um, illustrated books last year, another four coming out. I am the artist but that became a musician, not the other way around. I've been doing art since 1962 when I was two. But um, yeah, uh, I think that. And I have my book publishing company. I put out more books, and I think the, the key is I'm doing some things with Def Jam. I think Enemy Radio, we have a project, and I'm going to actually make that a combination of music with art and then the technology making art live. And uh, I've done more than 40,000. I'm, I'm actually two artists. One is Chuck, and the other is Anonymous because it's really controversial or risque. And it's like Banksy, and I love it too. <laughs> and I've done 40,000 pieces of art, and, and they're splashed all over social media, and everybody's asking all over the world for more and more. So I think um, the combinations with music, and also not just my music, but other artists' music to go along with the art that I present. I mean, I'm, listen, I don't know about the music and all that, but in art, I am a beast, for real. I am the beast because of my, my speed and what I want to do by the time I'm 70, which is only seven years away, is be the most accomplished illustrator ever from hip hop and rap music. My, he my, hero, my, hero is, my hero in art, before I close it, is Ronnie Wood of the Rolling Stones. Ronnie Wood is also, you know, has books under the same companies that I distribute. And Ron when I heard that Ronnie Wood, and this is an interesting short story, when I heard that Ronnie Wood, every hotel room he went into on a Rolling Stones tour, he would sketch it out. That gave me an idea what to do with my downtime for all those tours around the world. 
you go to a spot, you're in the city for four days, you've been there a hundred times. So I turned my room into an art studio the last 15 years and it's exploded. So that's what I want the next seven years. Whether, I, whether dead or alive, the art lives and that's the beautiful thing about music. Dead or alive, your signature is on across the sands of time, whether it's sight, sound, story, or your style. Never lose your signature, keep the scars sometime, and rock on. All right, looks like we got one last question from the audience. What's one of the best performances you saw this last year? Hip Hop 50 last year, man, I'm telling you, that shit was crazy. I mean, LL and Questlove put together the, the, the Force Tour and for OGs, old heads. I mean, that shit was a CBS special. I mean, everybody, it, it pulled out all the stops. So this year, when they cut back, and, and big ups to my man, my, my, my bro OG, Killer Mike, on the Michael, right? He got televised at two o'clock in the afternoon. So there was a whole bunch of, damn, Neil Grammys fucked us on that. And, and I had to tell a lot of people like, wait a minute, you know they was gonna fall back after all the, the, the hip hop 50 that they put down, you know they are gonna fall back in hip hop 51. So the momentum of making sure we do our right thing, our, our thing the right way makes, you know, artists like Lady London be eligible for that next year on her album coming out. So that's what we laid it down for. So yeah, that performance to me was just like everybody was invited. They pulled out the stops and I, I was I was thrown aback. I was like, whoa. So I was I was blown away, which is good. Um Usher in Vegas. Kirk Franklin reunion tour. With Kier, well, Karen Clark Sheard and everybody, just incredible. Oh my God, so good. Well, I, I'm excited at what's next. So um, I'm excited to work with you again, Tunji, and, and all you guys, you know, and it's been fantastic the last day spending time talking about what you think the future looks like and how you're going to shape it. And, uh, Tunji, sitting down with you a couple months back when we, I think the first, I walked into your office and you're like, so, what's up with this Bandcamp thing? <laughs> so, I'm looking forward to working with you guys all on Bandcamp. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. And uh, like Lady London said, new music soon. And okay. a, a new Chuck D album on the way as well. Thank you, guys. And that's a wrap. Thanks, everybody.